And so you want to include uh, just an art, like a, a mixing term between the two uh, and it field has some very basic properties because we know essentially uh, that the universe is, is homogeneous. The sets of transition amplitudes um, has some kind of space-time diagram. My mom once asked me that. You know, so so from nine to five, what do you actually do? And so you think, well, I drink some coffee and <laughs> talk to people and you know, sit at a computer, and it's it's very much sounds like a desk job, which it is a desk job. There is a lot of excitement in Canadian scientific circles tonight. World-famous astrophysicist Stephen Hawking has arrived in Ontario, where he will spend the next six weeks studying the origins of the universe. I think having someone like Stephen Hawking around is very important. To be around people who have done this breakthrough and to be able to interact with, uh, with them is a gift. They are inspiring, so they are inspiring to maybe be more ambitious. Having people who have done things that you really admire down the hall, people can't help but have the sort of quality of their work raised by that. You get a new perspective, and you get a perspective that you don't get in books, that you don't get from a community, you get something radically fresh. For me, it would be very difficult not to be able to write. And, uh, and so he must have a very powerful ability to think in his head and think through many steps in his head without recording them or bouncing them off other people. And that's, uh, that's a powerful skill and concentration that uh, is very rare and I, I don't have. What we're interested in is uh, infrared fluctuations and the difficulties of calculating into sitter space and to what extent the infrared divergences. So the problem that I was talking to Stephen about, if you were in the very early universe, it would be like being in a fog, a very luminous fog with all sorts of light in it. And as the universe cooled, it got to a point where uh, the temperature fell to the point where atoms could form and the universe became transparent. And so if you were there, all of a sudden you could see across the universe and all that light that was there that used to be bouncing around is still there. The properties of the light is random. There's, there's fluctuations in it. And when people try and calculate the pattern of fluctuations, what they find is that the equations don't make sense. And so there's a mathematical mistake that's being made in some cases, is, is what the question was. Of all the things we find beautiful and fascinating, of all the things we could do, so even evolutionarily speaking, why do we do this? I think it's this you know, search for pattern and search for connection. Well, I grew up in the countryside and I used to sleep outside, in fact, very often, and look up at the stars. And the, uh, you know, it's, occasionally you could see meteor showers and things like that. When I read science fiction, it was sort of the most fantastic sort of exploration that you can imagine. You know, people exploring the entire galaxy, the entire universe. Uh, and you need all this kind of interesting technology to do that. And so it really was, you know, sort of spurred my imagination and made me really interested in uh, figuring out how real was any of that, how possible was any of that, and what was going on in the universe. Physics is about curiosity. So the fascination with physics is not specifically about physics. It's just about the, the, the power and the pleasure to discover, to expand your, uh, you know, your imagination. When I was very young, probably six or seven, I wanted to be a mathematician. Uh, and I didn't know anything about physics. And when I got to about junior high school, and I started, again, reading more science fiction, and I learned about physics, and especially I learned about Einstein and relativity and you know, why it's impossible to travel uh, to the stars. Uh, that was the point where I decided, okay, this is mathematics, but it's also very uh, sort of creative and, and big picture, and I can combine those two things uh, and do theoretical physics. I know that for a lot, I, for a lot of um, people I work with, they had some sort of sudden experience, or ever since they were a little kid, they were very interested in science and math. But, um, for me, I did always. I definitely always liked math. Um, I wasn't always really interested in science. It was. It was actually only when, um, at the towards the end of high, of high school, I I took uh, my first physics class, and uh, I had a very good teacher. Physics or mathematics is one element where um, you have this experience. You know, you think about a problem, and and the understanding. What happens when you start to understand something is that you're your mental space 
expand. The universe has not just laws, not just mathematical laws that govern it, but incredibly beautiful, sort of unimaginably beautiful mathematical laws that, that, that as time goes on, we, we discover more and more beauty about them. So another equation which I find um, absolutely beautiful is due to Feynman. Um, and it's called the Feynman path integral. It should be looked at it like as a painting, okay? And this is a beautiful equation because of all the space it contains inside, all the mystery it contains inside. You might not think that's beautiful, but that tells you how matter moves given that space is curved. The physicist sees those equations and sees the idea and says that's a very beautiful thing. It looks kind of big and long, but uh, this, is, this is, in my opinion, uh, one of the most beautiful equations uh, that, that humans have discovered. And uh, it's, the, it's the standard model of particle physics uh, coupled to Einstein's theory of general relativity. The beauty that I'm talking about is very similar, I would say, to the beauty in a lot of music. The sensation that you have when you say that a piece by Bach is very sort of, it's intricate, but it's very tightly bound together and beautiful. So the beauty that I mean is some mixture of it being extremely concise, so it takes a huge amount of apparently random facts about the universe and gives a very tight, very short, concise explanation uh, or rule that, that governs all of it. Um, but not just that, it's, it's, this, it's, this, it's this fact that they're also extremely symmetric, that they're very much like, in that sense, it's also like the beauty of a very symmetrical gem. I missed the first part of that, unfortunately. Consider space is at finite temperature. That cuts off the divergences. That's that's true. And depending on if you mean ultraviolet divergences, it's true that it cuts those off. But uh, what we I imagine it's frustrating for him to, to to not move with the flow of the conversation. But uh, it's just it's just a, it's a different kind of a conversation than you normally have. It's, it was much easier once you guys all left, because then he could do he could write his thing, and you can see you can see what he's writing as he's writing it. And that was actually interesting in itself. And uh, and then people would come in, and and there's you could you could take the spotlight off of him and talk to someone else, and then he wouldn't feel like you're looking over his shoulder, and and that he had to produce these words quickly. But I imagine once you get used to it, it's it's like everything else. So very often I'll be uh, sitting in a plane, you know, sitting in the train, traveling to work, and I'll be working on something, and people say, "What?" What are you doing? What, what kind of math is that? You know, what, why are you doing that? It's like if you had asked Galileo um, a long time ago, what are the practical implications of looking at the, looking at the sky with a telescope? You know, in fact, several hundred years hence, there are very important practical implications. And I, I get some really interesting responses. My favorite one was somebody who said to me, you know, are, are you sure? that that's the most productive use of your time. Are you sure you're contributing to society? There's a natural human need to, to explore what is out there in the universe around us. Any type of understanding of fundamental physics radically changed the world, radically changed the way we think, the way we function, the way we interact uh, with each other. It has consequences you know, beyond what we look for. If I think about what good am I, I'm not sure, but, but I have to believe that there's some use in exploring, right? Why do we try to keep pushing boundaries in everything that we do? We are able to take a picture of the universe at the moment where uh, the light is free. So there's this immense burst of light and we have this picture now. This is a time which was 14 billion years ago and we can see it, we can, you know, uh, analyze it. The fact that we, we can, us humans now, relate to that moment is quite uh, amazing. Mm -hmm.